This panel is going to be focusing on use of force investigations and oversight. And as Chuck Ramsey announced at the beginning of the first panel, we're not going to go into lengthy introductions. The bios are available on our website and on handouts uh, for the people who are with us in the audience. So I'll just have short identifiers uh, for our panelists who are here today. Uh, we do have an excellent panel with us, and we'll start off with Chuck Wexler, uh, Executive Director for PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum. Uh, Dr. Wexler? Hello. Okay. Testing. Yep. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Robinson, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, Director Davis, and members of the task force. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for what you're doing for the country. And, um, and this, is, this is the most, one of the most important things we've seen in the last 20 years. So I've served at PERF for a number of years. Uh, PERF is a, a research think tank membership organization. I want to describe to you PERF's current research and what we have learned from many forward-thinking <coughs> police chiefs. Each year, PERF conducts research projects on some of the most compelling issues. For example, in September, we convened a meeting in Chicago with over 200 police chiefs in the wake of the Ferguson incident. Also recently, we released a report on body-worn cameras. But today, I want to focus my testimony on use of force and oversight. Your interest in use of force investigations may stem from the fact that when there is a controversial officer-involved shooting or other use of force, in the large majority of cases, the use of force is found to be justified by the circumstances. But in some cases, the officer's use of force is questioned. And so community members become frustrated. We need strong systems for reviewing police use of force, and these systems must demonstrate transparency to the public. State and local jurisdictions are considering a variety of proposals to increase accountability. However, I believe there is a larger issue that is beginning to gain traction among progressive police chiefs and sheriffs, namely that in addition to reviewing particular use of force incidents after the fact, we need to acknowledge that some of these incidents could have been prevented and we must try to find ways of preventing those incidents in the first place. We need to go upstream. And by that I mean, what are some of the things that we know about use of force that are important? And I wanna, in, in the time I have, briefly describe to you nine areas where I think we, what we have learned about use of force. Number one. Policies matter. Policies matter. For example, PERF has long called for policies that bar officers from shooting at moving vehicles. If a driver is shot, the vehicle becomes a totally unguided threat. And this isn't anything new. In 1972, the New York City Police Department put this in place and shootings plummeted. Number two, tactics matter. By that I mean police are trained in tactics for many different types of situations and where they put themselves and how they position themselves is incredibly important. If they put themselves in a position where they can not do anything but use deadly force, they will use deadly force. We also know that if you get a sergeant to the scene of a potential use of force, the chances of it not becoming a deadly force situation are significantly increased. Number three, de-escalation skills are critical. In, in traditional police culture, officers are taught never to back down from a confrontation, but instead to run toward the dangerous situation everyone else is running from. In active shooter situations, we expect officers to do that. But there are a lot of other kind of situations in which officers need to be taught how to de-escalate. We know how to escalate situations. How do we bring it back down? <coughs> Number four, and probably at the center of all of these discussions, is one word and that is respect, because words matter. In these confrontations, how citizens talk to police and how police talk to citizens is incredibly important. The Gates-Crowley incident that we looked at, we found out that was incredibly important, how those two people taught each other. 
Number five, learning from incidents is not second guessing. In the aftermath of a controversial shooting by an officer, it's not unusual to hear a police officer say, the officer had to make a split second decision. We shouldn't have to second guess that decision. It is not, it is not second guessing the decision to learn from what happened and document that so that other officers and citizens can benefit. Number six, persons with mental illness. Often it seems that our streets are filled with disturbed individuals leading troubled lives. People with mental illness or developmental disability, drug addiction or other conditions act erratically and dangerously. If the person starts to wave a knife or other we weapon, results can be disastrous. Sometimes it's simply a cry for help. We need to be able to identify those situations, to train people to deal with them, and deal with them by slowing things down, calling for backup, or using crisis intervention skills. Number seven, integrated training. Many police chiefs endorse scenario-based training. Very important. Such training aims to replicate the quickly changing, often chaotic circumstances that happen. Too many departments have training programs that are fragmented, with separate courses on use of force, encounters with mentally ill persons, and so forth. We need to re-engineer how police training is conducted so that it integrates all aspects of police work in ways that mirror what actually happens. As more police departments deploy body cameras, we need to use that as ways of how are things successfully resolved. Number eight, diversifying police forces. We know it's important to diversify police forces. It's necessary but not sufficient because what we also know is we, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or gender, they have to be carefully trained and supervised. And finally, um, we need a comprehensive approach. It's not one of all of the things I just mentioned. It's all of those things. Look, we, were very, we have been very successful in reducing crime. It's phenomenal what's happened under 300 homicides in New York City compared to 2,200. Today, we need to make similar change in our approaches to reducing use of force. Instead of focusing almost entirely on how we investigate incidents after they occur, we need to develop strategies for preventing incidents. We need to collect accurate information, analyze patterns, develop best practices, and measure how each department is doing to reduce use of force. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wexler. Uh, our next witness is the District Attorney in Salt Lake County, Utah, uh, Mr. Sim Gill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, and I want to uh, thank the task force for the invitation and opportunity to share some thoughts and hopefully start a conversation about the use of force issues confronting all of us in law enforcement and the collective impact upon the community of citizens who we are institutionally responsible and ultimately to serve. Uh, my name is Sim Gill, and as the Salt Lake County District Attorney for the state of Ute in the state of Utah, my office in the last four years has reviewed more than 50 officer-involved shootings for a county of 1.1 million people. Uh, folks, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, we have issues that we have to address. And what is I interesting is the, the broader dialogue uh, is complex and nuanced, and I guess what I want to uh, s indicate to you is that the population that I represent is fairly homogeneous. It does not have some of the complexity of some of the large um, uh, uh, cities that we have. Some of the minority populations, race relation issues, which are prevalent there, but it is instructive to say that then maybe this is a systemic challenge that we need to look, look at as uh, beyond that as well, and I think that's a good insight. Through this process over the last 20 years as a, as a prosecutor, I've seen the slow <coughs> erosion and, uh, of public trust culminating to the current crisis of legitimacy, implicating perceptions of procedural fairness, distrust, anxiety, and distance between citizens and law enforcement to the detriment of both. A culture of suspicions now further isolates law enforcement from its citizens. I believe that the current issue implicates a wide variety of issues. However, to fully appreciate the challenge, we must approach this as a systems approach or a systems challenge. That implicates culture, practice, training, meaningful accountability, to name just a few. And if I can offer some specific recommendations today to start the systemic challenge dialogue, I would offer the following suggestions. 
at the macro level, a robust Department of Justice civil rights section uh, oversight. And what I mean by that, that is both currently as complaint driven, but more importantly, proactively engaged. What does that mean? This would be a two-pronged approach. First, respecting the current approach, which is complaint driven. When a crisis or allegations are made in a particular community, they have an obligation to go there and address those issues and investigate. The second thing I would propose is that a, the DOJ, for example, would take the country into geographic demigrations and regions and engage in what I would call random independent audits, annual audits, with an eye towards proactive compliance this, uh, to assist those communities. The second action alone would change the terrain and introduce with it a, with a renewed seriousness, seriousness the necessity of law enforcement agency to internalize civil rights compliance and engage in best practices. The next effect would be for law, law enforcement administrations to engage in a cultural shift with the recognition that best practices need to become routine because any agency would be subject to random audit. The second thing that I would suggest is a, the DOJ should uh, identify best practices, both uh, uh, best practices that, that is re recognized through its experiences and research and investigations con uh, consistent with civil rights compliances. This would, in essence, create for the first time <coughs> national standards of civil rights compliance as a DOJ certification program. This would be voluntary, not mandatory. The DOJ would certify agencies that consistently meet and implement best practices. This would, again, further proactively change uh, uh, and what would be, become internalized and effectuate a culture of change, uh, and it would demonstrate agency compliance and, more importantly, signify from law enforcement agencies to their communities that, they are, that, that these issues are not only a priority, but it also implemented practice. <clears throat> the third thing that we've also talked about and we've heard about is the paucity of statistical data that is available. Uh, we have, in, in this day and age, when this, uh, we can have statistical data on, almost on anything, but when it comes to law enforcement, we don't have it. And, uh, and there's no national standards of figuring out what this entails. What is use of force? What is the lethal use of force? What is non-lethal use of force? And how, what is the frequency and prevalence with which agencies are engaging in that? And when we don't have that data, it lends itself to a suspicion, which is sometimes unfair, but we, we fuel that suspicion. One way that it could be done is that uh, in, in this day and age, when we have federal grants that are given to it, just like Department of Transportation or other federal agency, if you want those federal uh, Department of Justice dollars, then you need to at least meet the minimum standards of uh, uh, reporting those data sets back to a central database. And I think that can be very easily be effectuated. At the sort of micro level, and just uh, before I run out of my time here, I apologize, uh, I would also say that we need to have independent investigations with no involvement from host agencies. We need to have independent reviews uh, with the office of an independent prosecutor because, not because I don't believe that I can do the job, because I don't want to contribute to a culture of suspicion and, uh, and, and biased conversations when the focus really ought to be at the core of what is driving a concern for our community about the facts and an Office of Independent Prosecutor. And finally, the results that are generated by that should be made public. What, the, what we have started to do when I first came in there four years ago, for the first time, when we finished our review, all of our reviews are posted on our website. The facts, the legal issues presented, the analysis for our citizens to consume and digest and recognize what we looked at and what they thought we didn't look at. I think more transparency <coughs> that we have, the greater public trust we will uh, uh, finally engender. I have always stated that the majority of law enforcement do their job professionally, honorably, and with great professionalism. <clears throat> However, the integrity of a system is not measured by the clearances that we would find. I, and I'll tell you, majority of the time, I'm going to find most of those cases justified. Why? Because often, and, uh, and they are well-trained, they're contextually there, and they are executing their responsibility honorably and, and faithfully. But the integrity of a system is not measured the 98 or 97 that I clear, but it is by the capacity to capture that one or two that needs to be captured, and in a process that is legitimate and trusted by our citizens. And that notion of procedural fairness and legitimacy is at the heart of this conversation. 
And when we fail, at the end of the day, the good officers, when we fail to hold bad officers accountable, good officers suffer. Our citizens suffer, and our public trust and legitimacy of our responsibilities suffer. And if we want to assist our best officers, then we should embrace this challenge in an open and transparent way. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Gill. Uh, our next witness will be Mr. Jay McDonald, uh, who is president of the Fraternal Order of Police in Ohio. Good morning. Maybe it's afternoon. <laughs> Been here a while. Um, today I'd like to talk about the use of force from the perspective of the rank and file officer who is governed in its use by the Graham Standard. <coughs> the Graham Standard provides that an officer should apply constitutionally appropriate levels of force to control resistive or aggressive behavior toward involved personnel, other personnel, third parties, or property. The level of force in response to a given situation must be reasonable. So what's reasonable? Chief Justice William Rehnquist makes it clear. The reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than the 2020 vision of hindsight. The calculus of reasonableness must embody allowances for the fact that the police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. The test of reasonableness is not capable of precise definition or mechanical application. I think it's important to reiterate that we must interpret reasonableness from the perspective of the officer and the information he or she had at the moment of the decision to use force. We cannot judge reasonableness of an officer's actions with information collected after the fact that was, known about the, was not known to the officer at the time. This is one of the FOP's concerns about surveillance cameras, body-worn cameras, or other electronic images recorded um, of a particular event. Uh, uh, provided to you an article from PoliceOne.com entitled 10 Limitations of Body Cams You Need to Know for Your Protection. It gives the reader an excellent overview of the limitations of this technology in reviewing use of force. Attached another article um, and, and would urge members of the, of the task force to uh, make uh, available to themselves information from the Force Science Institute. The institute was, which provides training and certification to law enforcement is a tremendous resource and I encourage you to take advantage of that resource. Let me make clear that the FOP does not oppose body-worn cameras or other, or other technology, provided that appropriate administration and oversight is pla in place to ensure evidentiary integrity and the protection of the citizens and officers' rights. In fact, we have uh, went as far as to develop a best practice document along with a slide presentation and a one-hour webinar that is available on our website, and I've submitted those materials to you as well. Given the holding in Graham, the next key step is to appropriately train officers as to what reasonable means. Before an officer can be properly trained, there needs to be an agreement on a use of force continuum. How do we define, in terms of policy and in a very general way, the different types of levels of force at an officer's lawful disposal? In Ohio, the biggest city in Ohio is Columbus. Most people are surprised to learn that Columbus is bigger than Cleveland and Cincinnati combined, but it is. And I've, used, I've put out there um, how they define levels of force. The first level is officer presence, verbal, nonverbal commands, searching, handcuffing, sparking a taser for compliance, using flashbangs or multiple baton rounds as a diversion. Level one is empty hand control, pressure points, grounding techniques, and joint manipulation manipulation. Level two is the use of a chemical spray. Level three is the use of an electronic device such as a taser. Level four is hard empty hand control such as a strike. <coughs> Level five is the use of an impact weapon such as a baton. <coughs> Level six is a police canine bite. Level seven is a less lethal weapon like a beanbag round and level eight is a deadly force. These levels define the use of force for Columbus police officers and it comports generally with most law enforcement agencies. Officers are trained to apply them appropriately to meet the threats and the needs of a given situation, um, and they provide a guide to the officer's decision-making when situations deteriorate or there's a need uh, for the officer to respond with an, ex in an escalation or a de-escalation uh, in that situation. That Resistance to direction or arrest does not mean an officer should desist or refrain from an enforcement act. Oh, thank you. Agency policy should be clear as to what and how much force is considered reasonable based generally on the situation. Again, Columbus Police Department as an example, there are four factors that officers consider. The severity of the crime, whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officer or others, 
whether the suspect is actively resisting and whether the suspect is actively attempting to <coughs> evade arrest. Given all of these guidelines, we still rely on the officer's judgment of the situation and the threat as he or she sees it. The officer's judgment and his subsequent reaction must be governed by the training he receives, which makes proper training and continued training absolutely vital. As I conclude, I just want to emphasize two points. The first is that we recruit, hire, train men and women knowing that we must be able to rely on their judgment in the field. When they put on the uniform, the badge, and the gun, they are empowered to exercise their police powers in the course of performing their sworn duty. Of all the characteristics we look for in officers, the most critical is judgment. The second most, point, most important point I'd like to emphasize is that we should not allow technology to replace that officer's judgment. Technology is a tremendous asset to law enforcement and to investigators, and internal reviews of use of force incidents have greatly improved because we have dash cam footage, surveillance camera footage, or other electronic means to analyze and evaluate the actions of all parties when it comes to use of force. But we should not allow this type of technology to affect the judgment of the officers with his or her own two eyes and ears in the exact moment facing that exact threat. And they must make that split second life or death decision. When we allow for technology to substitute for judgment, that allows for hesitation and hesitation can mean death or serious injury to the officer or others. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming to Ohio. Thank you for coming to Cincinnati. Thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you so much, Mr. McDonald. Our final witness on this panel is Kirk Primus, who is Assistant Sheriff in Las Vegas, a Metropolitan Police Department. Mr. Primus. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I do so with over 32 years of uh, law enforcement experience. I want to take a different approach today and, and just tell you our story in Las Vegas because it's very relevant to this discussion. In 2010, our agency had 25 officer-involved shootings. This was the highest number of shootings in the agency's history. Six of those involved unarmed persons. Members from the local chapters of the ACLU, NAACP, as well as other community members began to challenge our actions. Furthermore, our local newspaper embarked on a year-long investigation looking into officer-involved shootings going back to 1990. By the end of 2011, the RJ published its findings in a five-part series titled Deadly Force, When Las Vegas Officers Shoot and Kill. While this was occurring, our agency, like so many others in the country, was facing a significant budget deficit, reducing its workforce by not filling existing positions, and responding to increased demands for quality police services. Morale diminished. Many employees were concerned about stable employment, even though the sheriff made it very clear there would be no layoffs. Compounding a work environment of uncertainty, we struggled with a policing philosophy that was putting us at odds with the community. Were we warriors or guardians? Many of us knew the answer, yet how does an organization convince its workforce during a particular time of stress that a shift in policing style was necessary to be successful? We had to look different than we did now. Recognizing the need to reform a culture that has been resistant to change, we entered into a first ever collaborative reform process through the Community Oregon Policing Service, the COPS Office. After a comprehensive assessment of our agency's policies and practices, we agreed to focus on four goals, four narrow goals. Reduce the number of officer-involved shootings, reduce the number of persons killed as a result of officer-involved shootings, transform the organization and culture as it relates to deadly force, and enhance officer safety. To organize the reform model, we separated our work into four primary areas. One being uh, robust policies that reflect community inclusion, transparency, and clear expectations. Two, developing a training curriculum based on real life scenarios. Three, developing investigative protocols that clearly demonstrate our desire to get to the root of decision making and problem solving. And four, developing an accountability model that was process driven and not people driven. Our use of force policy was the most significant policy change that we made during our reform. Taking advice from our multicultural committees, local ACLU and NAACP, we added language emphasizing the sanctity of life. Using this phrase as our guiding principle, we understood de-escalation over the use of force, redefined levels of resistance and control, modified our electronic control device usage and reporting requirements, defined officer expectations when using less lethal shotguns, and placed greater responsibility on first-line supervisors during tactical operations. 
In our mind, this was the beginning of a policy shift from the, the warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. But a policy is useless unless the workforce sees it as credible. Training, whereas the use of force policy set the direction for culture change, the creation and impl implementation of reality-based training or scenario-based training gave our reform efforts momentum and credibility that the work with the workforce and community. <coughs> By reconstructing a number of Austinville shootings and critical incidents that occurred within the Las Vegas Valley, we were able to create a series of scenario-based exercises that emphasized containment, de-escalation, force transition, squad tactics, <coughs> decision-making, and problem-solving. Through this training, we were able to teach our workforce how to better problem-solve a critical event before using a deadly force option. As for the community, Many other reform stakeholders have gone through this training and frequently walk away with a different, different perception about force when they started. Today, this training is well received by our workforce as well as the community. In my view, that's the leading reason why we were able to reduce our officer-involved shootings. Our success was clearly evident in our numbers. We reduced our shootings to 13 in 2012. And in 2014, every one of our officer-involved shootings in, involved a violently armed uh, subject. In 2010, we created the critical incident review process, which was and is responsible for conducting an administrative review of all officer-involved shootings and other high-risk operations. These reviews serve a number of purposes. First, they are complete, thorough, and offer an organization a systematic review into an officer's decision to use deadly force. Second, the reviews explore actions and decision-making of officers leading up to and during and after the use of deadly force. Many lessons can be learned by viewing a critical incident in, an, in its entirety as opposed to limiting the review to only that moment in time when force is used. Third, the criminal investigation is reviewed to ensure investigative integrity. Fourth, the findings from the CERT review can be measured against training objectives to compare what is occurring on the street as to what is being trained in a controlled environment. And last, the findings of the review are presented at the critical incident review process. In 2014, at the recommendation of the COPS office, we, mo we moved the responsibility of investigating deadly force incidents from our homicide section and established a standalone force investigation team. There are a number of benefits for doing so. First, Fit, fit detectives only investigate deadly force and categorical uses of force incidents. This allows them to focus singly on force investigations. Second, fit detectives become, become experts in their field, thus establishing credibility and trust between the agency and the community regarding their investigations. Third, fit detectives are part of the organizational learning environment, thus offer an immediate glimpse into training and equipment issues that may arise during the course of the criminal investigation. And last, the team is small, thus making it easier to, to ensure acceptable and standardized investigative protocols. Developing an accountability model. There is no one perfect accountability system. But we can rest assured that if such a system is based on personality, it, will, it is certain to fail. That said, our agency and community has worked hard to create and modify several accountability systems that we hope leads to greater transparency and community trust. First, within an hour or so after a deadly force incident, the captain overseeing our FIT team conducts a media statement, which is immediately posted on YouTube. Following the media statement, the captain participates in a local press briefing. More than ever before, we find ourselves getting ahead of the conversation by providing timely and accurate information to the public. Second, complete investigative reports from the force investigation team, as well as the district attorney, are uploaded onto our agency website. This allows for interested parties to come to their own conclusions about the case and how effective our agency was in, in conducting the investigation. To this end, the district attorney plays an important and active role. They respond to the scene during the initial incident and are also present during an early briefing to the sheriff. And last, we established a bifurcated deadly force review process, referred to as the critical incident review process that thoroughly reviews all aspects of an incident involving the use of deadly force by an officer. This board is comprised of four citizen members who are not affiliated with the agency and three commissioned police officers. It is a two-part process that examines tactics, decision-making, policy, procedure, training, supervision, as well as the actual use of force. At the, conclusion of the, at the conclusion of the presentations, 
All members of the board are permitted to ask questions of the investigator and the members who were involved in the incident. The board then renders their decision first on the actual use of force and then on all aspects associated with the incident. As compared to other systems we had had in place previously, we've seen a 30% increase in sanctions coming from the board regarding tactics, decision-making, supervision, and the use of deadly force. Uh, it's important to note that the citizen board members are invited uh, to the scene of an officer involved shooting uh, when it happens to get a sense of, of what happened. Uh, next steps, uh, and, and quickly, uh, as a forward learning organization, we are not done examining best practices, nor are we done with the collaborative reform process. We continue to seek new and innovative ways to reduce the use of deadly force, enhance training, improve safety, and analyze our agency's force profile. Uh, the recommendations as we share with many agencies that visit us and, and review our programs, there are four areas that we will continue to focus on. First is relevant and updated policies. Second, frequent effective training. Third, consistent and transparent investigative protocols. And finally, maintaining an effective accountability model. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start off the questioning with Mr. Gill. Uh, one of the toughest uh, challenges that we're gonna be facing, Mr. Gill, is looking at the issues around investigation and then prosecution of officer, potentially officer-involved shootings. And I know you alluded to a potential special prosecutor or office, uh, an office of independent prosecutor. Is that something that you've already set up or can you discuss that a little bit more? You kind of went quickly over it in order to get to the rest of your statement. Sure. Um, that is something that I think I suggest that we should do. And I do that from the experience that I've had because a, as a public prosecutor, you are in a damned if you do and damned you don't situation. Because if you, uh, if you make one decision, one segment of the population is going to be uh, agreeing and happy, another segment is going to be upset and vice versa. And I think that there is some uh, legitimacy uh, to say that I, know, I, I don't know of prosecutors who are biased in their judgment, but it's not an issue of actual bias, it's the issue of perception. One of the things that we need to recognize that we're, ta we're really talking about a systems approach and, and the credibility and the perception is the reality of our community. If we know that that is one of the underlying concerns of our community, then it's incumbent upon us to say how can we, if we can, without compromising our responsibilities, create those models that will continue to foster that uh, open communications, why wouldn't we want to do that? Now, the challenge is that, uh, that you have, no matter what decision you make, you're gonna have uh, uh, allegation of that there's some bias or collusion because you're favoring law enforcement or you're against law enforcement, and the way you get around it is to say, okay, let's make this into an office of the independent prosecutor. Let's make an office that is separate and independent, and uh, when those decisions are made, that, that, that issue is removed so you can focus on the underlying facts, on the evidence, on the issues that are driving that decision. I think now, are, are there ways that we can safeguard around it if that is not available? I think there are. There are ways that we can get around it. But at the same time, if that is an option that is available to us, what harm is done? It's, it protects the interests of uh, law enforcement, so they feel that the process is fair, which is just as important to them and, uh, and should be, a and it creates a sense of fairness within the community as well. Now, in, in our situation, uh, what we have is a process where the, uh, we have this sort of a joint investigation that occurs, uh, which has sort of a degrees of uh, investment that are done by different uh, law enforcement agencies. I have about 14 law enforcement agencies that I serve uh, within my jurisdiction. Uh, we, uh, when an incident happens, we send out investigators from the district attorney's office and they're supposed to work jointly with the local host agency. Now, even uh, of our best professional efforts, it lends itself to a perception of bias. So we know that and so we're already at a losing conversation uh, at that, even if there is no bias or any collusion, it nonetheless lends itself to that conversation. So I think it's incumbent upon us to remove that. And by the same token, 
by the same token. Now, look, in the last four and a half years, four years, I have made call, difficult calls where I have found officers to be unjustified that did not endear me to them. And at the same time, I have made calls on some very critical situations where the community has not been happy with me because, they, because the officer was absolutely justified. One of those was involved a body cam where there was no gun that was found and there was a totality of circumstances that you had to go through that uh, factual analysis. And I guess my point is, at that point, if we know those are the challenges, why not create an independent office that, that recognizes the best efforts of uh, expectations of both entities without giving it any kind of additional um, uh, bias or perception of bias? That's my ideal wish list. Okay, and then very quickly, would you envision this being appointed by the governor? Is this a state body? I think, uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, that's going to be uh, something that uh, you can work out in the details there. But I think what you have to do is, again, you know, appoint, uh, the, the balance between an elected and appointed position is that as an elected, I own my decisions. And if, I, and if I make mistakes, then there's a checks and balances from the community to say, well, you, you didn't do it. You, if, you, if you're going to do an appointed position, then you need to make sure that the structure is such that it is genuinely independent. That means that there are no financial ties that limit it, that there are no structural ties, ties in terms of investigative authority. It has to be genuinely and truly independent, just not in name only. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Tracy Mears, who will be followed by Brian Stevenson. Thank you so much for testifying today. I found um, so much of what all you had to say very helpful and enlightening. I want to turn from Professor Robinson's questions about institutional capacity for doing oversight and um, ask you some questions about the substance of those standards. Um, this is one question. It has two parts. Um, one part of it is for Commander McDonald, and the other part is for Professor, I'm sorry, Chuck, Dr. Wexler. Um, okay, so. Um, in your testimony, Commander McDonald, you rely on the Graham standards, which I teach to my students as constitutional standards or floors. Um, you know, they may not necessarily be best practices, they're minimums. And in your testimony, you set out the Columbus Police Department's directives. Um, first, just a technical question. I'm not sure I actually understand the difference between levels five, six, and seven, so if you could uh, speak to that, that would be helpful to me because they basically look to be about the same thing. Um, and then the second part of my question for you is what do you think about Dr. Wexler's points about um, more concrete policies around the use of force? So your comments were about you know, the, the Graham standard being almost to invoke another Supreme Court decision on, I know it when I see it. Um, I'll leave it to you to remember what that standard that was about. Um, that doesn't sound like the kind of policies that Dr. Wexler was talking about, so I'd like to know what you think about that. Um, Dr. Wexler, for you, the flip side of that question, um, how do you think about the relationship between the very detailed policies that you described for us so compellingly and the need um, for officers in the field in the heat of the moment to use their best judgment? Ready? Okay. Um, I agree with you that the Graham standard um, is the floor, um, but it is, it is one of the ways in which the officers are judged. Uh, judged by their policies is a completely different way. Um, but I believe that the subject of reasonableness is how officers are taught in this state that you will be judged by your conduct and whether it was reasonable and reasonable compared to what another, you know, what an officer would, would find reasonable in that, in that scenario. So um, I think it's important and, and one that we can't uh, just gloss over and say, well, we don't want to consider the Graham standard anymore because it is uh, worked. It has worked uh, well for years, and it is one that, that has been taught. However, that does not mean that we can improve upon the performance of officers through different policies and different me methods and different tactics. So um, I'm not saying that that is the only way that we should judge officers. Um, so I, I, I think the things that, uh, that Dr. Wexler was talking about, um, specifically, um, I think all those things are fine to be trained. And all those things uh, very well may be helpful. Um, you know, his, his eight points. Um, 
but what, but what I heard from the previous panel and, and sometimes what I hear um, a, as this subject is debated um, in this forum, uh, Governor Kasich in Ohio has his own forum, Attorney General DeWine in Ohio has his own forum, and, and, and what I hear a lot is how um, we need more training, we need more officers on the scene, we need sergeants on the scene fast, and what nobody ever talks about is how do you pay for that, and uh, that needs to be an important part of this conversation because uh, officers in this state have been downsized, and that's a, not an Ohio uh, situation, that's a national situation, and the best way to reduce uses of force is to have two officers or more there. It is the best way to protect an officer, and it is the best way to protect a citizen. Is, and the best tool I can have is not a body camera or not even a weapon. The best tool I can have is a partner, um, which is lacking in this state and across the country. Um, but I believe a comprehensive approach with um, looking at these policies and making sure they work um, is admirable. It is something we should aspire to do. Um, but I want to also caution that you should not try to make a one-size-fit-all policy. The vast majority of police departments have less than 10 people. The vast majority of police departments um, serve small, small communities. It's true in Ohio. It's true across the country. So something that may work in Las Vegas with may be completely overkill in Macomb, Ohio, that has a chief who is also the road deputy and the evidence custodian and the guy who takes the phone call. So we need to make sure that we're considering those factors as well. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Mears, in answer to your question, I'll give you a specific example. Um, say the issue of shooting at vehicles, per se. So in 1972, when the New York City Police Department changed that policy, they didn't simply, and that was a time, I might add, when 25 police officers were killed, and the New York City Police maybe killed 100 <coughs> citizens. So it, it was a very violent time for them to change. Why did they change it? Jim Fife, then a lieutenant with the NYPD who would go on to be a professor uh, at Temple, analyzed it and realized the situations were such that officers were putting themselves in positions where they could get hurt and the citizens were dying needlessly. Officers would position themselves in front of the vehicle, the car would come at them, and it would be like a standoff. Citizen would get shot, police officer could get injured. That was 30 years ago. They changed that policy. The numbers plummeted. So why is that important? Because officers need to know the policy. And that's why when you go all the way down, you investigate it. If the policy is flawed to begin with, then the investigation is going to relate to that flawed policy. That's why you hear some say, well, they're in policy. Well, if the policy is bad, they're in a bad policy, but you can't, you, you, you can't punish an officer for a department's bad policy. You need to correct the policy first. So an officer knows, I shouldn't stand in front of that car because if I do, number one, you know, I might get killed, and number two, I'm out of policy. So having that policy is very important. But officers thought for the longest time, and still do, that they need to have that opening should their lives be endangered. 30 years ago, that policy was put in place by the NYPD. No NYPD officer, to my knowledge, has ever been hurt because of it. So departments have to have strong policies. Answer to the second part of your question is they need to know that going into these situations. My department tells me I'm not supposed to do this. I need to have alternatives. I can't put myself in a position where I'm going to get killed or a citizen is. And so that's why the strong policies, the training is important. These things happen very quickly. The Ferguson incident, beginning to end, 90 seconds. Professor Gates, when he was arrested in Cambridge, four and a half minutes. So if they don't know what they're going to do beforehand, if there aren't strong policies, if there isn't training, and if there isn't a sense of, you know, what do you do, then you're behind it. And there is a real problem, I'll say, too, with all of these small agencies, because they don't have the benefits of the training that the larger agencies do. So it is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Stevenson, followed by Sean Smoot. Uh, this has been an extremely helpful panel. I want to thank all of you for your specific recommendations. I just have uh, three directed questions, and I'll make them short so I can get your answers. Uh, Dr. Wexler, I really appreciated your referencing the challenges of police departments dealing with the growing population of mentally disabled people, mental illness, and the interactions that that triggers. 
I'd be interested in knowing if you are aware of any department protocols or practices that are helping uh, officers manage the challenges of interacting with people with mental illness uh, more effectively, just something that we could look at that might shape our thinking on that. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Gill, I really appreciate the recommendations that you made, and I was interested in your suggestion about a random audit by the Justice Department. I'd like to know whether you think that kind of auditing can be done at the state and local level, uh, and, and even if it can, why you would prefer the federal government to be in that role, if that's your uh, preference. Uh, and then my question for you, Mr. McDonald, is really about your emphasis on judgment, which I, I appreciate. But I'd like to hear your thoughts about how, you know, in my view, judgment really is shaped by experience. And oftentimes, police officers are interacting with people from different races, from different cultures, from different backgrounds, uh, with whom they have very limited experience. And I'm just curious whether you think that reliance on judgment when people are dealing with situations where they're less experienced creates some of the problems that we've been seeing and how we're going to deal with that judgment gap if, if you think that gap is relevant. Uh, I'll, I'll answer really quickly. Um, uh, three departments which I would mention, of course, Memphis is where it all started with their crisis intervention team and a lot of departments have modeled after that one. Montgomery County also uh, is a very good department that has, that puts a focus on dealing with that. And That's uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. Correct. Okay. okay. And finally, uh, New Haven, which uh, partners with the Yale Child Study Center, uh, has had a long history of um, dealing with those kind of incidents. As to, uh, as to your question, um, I guess you know, uh, the reason I want the, the federal is because I think it has the appropriate distance, and it also has the appropriate gravitas, uh, that it, uh, it is looking under a, a national standard of, of, of federal uh, uh, civil rights compliance. Um, it, it, they understand and recognize what those uh, standards are. Uh, take, for example, their subsequent uh, findings that were done in Albuquerque. They came in as an outside agency, looked at it, did an analysis, and laid bare sort of the factual and uh, uh, cultural issues that were pre present there as an outside agency. Uh, you know, when you have a, a community that's paid almost $24 million in settlements and don't, they don't think that there's a problem, the, the, the capacity to fully appreciate because the perspective, the distance that you need to have the kind of proper perspective may be skewed by that. The, the other reason I think that state agencies maybe not is because they're also going to be probably tied to state funding issues, which then can serve as subtle pressures that, uh, that could be there. These are folks that still have to live within those communities. And what we're really talking about is to look at objective, factual uh, uh, fa uh, gathering, which has a certain distance and a, a certain level of trust. Um, I mean, look, it, it, the idea here is to change a culture. Um, I, I am a, a strong advocate that, uh, that individuals perform to the level the systems uh, 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 both train and could put the expectations. By and large, majority of law enforcement uh, 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 choose this profession because they want to serve. It is not their fault, uh, it is rather a systemic failure. And, uh, and I think the only way you can do a cultural change is to have those kind of systemic uh, 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 motivations. I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, we know this from our own personal lives. We, we, uh, we file tax returns, and majority of the people are compliant and do it well because, uh, because they know that there might be a random chance that you might get audited. Uh, and there's a culture of wanting to do the right thing. And I think, I think that is why I look at the DOJ that way, and I'm, I'm a little hesitant for state. I think that, that having said that, any entity that can bring that kind of objectivity, of course, I'll take a state uh, uh, oversight as well if we can assure those other issues uh, which we know are going to be raised in regards to that. Uh, Sean Smoot, fault. oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Um, in regard to the question about judgment and dealing with people you have limited experience um, with, I, I, I still think the officer needs to be judged on what, what actions he took not actions, uh, um, what, what actions he took or he, she took based on the information he or she had at the time. Um, I, I will tell you that perception drives more of this situation than um, reality in a lot of times, and I have an example to, to illustrate. I'm working midnight shift, I'm driving southbound, I see a car pull away from the curb, and I immediately do a U-turn, get out, and stop it. 
immediately. Female driver in the car immediately says, I stopped her because she was black and she believed it in her heart. You know, I, I just, you know it, she believed it. And I reached in her car and turned her headlights on and I walked away, never said a word to her because she knew that I could not talk to her for 25 minutes would never change her mind. And that's what we have to get at. And we have to build that trust ahead of time, not on the side of the road at the traffic stop, not, um, not in somebody's house dealing with them um, in, in a domestic situation. That work has to be done ahead of time. Um, but at the end of the day, communities hire law enforcement officers and they swear an oath to protect and serve the community and we train them and we equip them and we give them the power and the authority to do that and we have to allow for their judgment. Many, many times as a supervisor reviewing use of force, you're looking at it and going, well, geez, this officer could have used more force. The situation allowed for more, but he didn't use it because in his judgment or her judgment, it wasn't appropriate. Sometimes it works the other way where their judgment is wrong and there needs to be scrutiny and there needs to be sanctions for when officers are wrong. But, I, but you know this, you know the vast majority of interactions result in no force and the vast majority of interactions that result in force, the officer's judgment is right. Sean Smoot, followed by Roberto Velasenor, and I'd ask everyone, because time is short, to be very brief. I, I will uh, certainly do my best. Thank you all for your testimony. First of all, it's been excellent uh, today. Uh, I want to focus in on the legal aspect a, a, a little bit of this, and so I have a real short question for Mr. Gill, and that is, uh, in the 50 or so cases that your office has reviewed, uh, how many of them have gone to grand jury review? Um, for uh, uh, Mr. I'm, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, uh, Mr. Primos. Um, I'm curious to know, was the union that represents the Las Vegas Metro officers involved in the formulation of your review process? And is the statement that officers make to the review commission, uh, that is in, the, the commission you talked about that includes civilians and officers, are those compelled statements? Um, and then, Mr. McDonald, I'd give you the opportunity, if you know, of a community where they um, conduct a, a review, post use of force uh, review uh, process that is considered to be uh, fair by both your members and members of the community. If you could just give us a kind of bullet points of how that works. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, to answer your question, zero, because we have very poor grand jury uh, 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 statutory framework in the state of Utah. They call it a grand jury, but it's on name and uh, only, and as we try to uh, uh, get access to it, because I think grand jury is actually a, uh, uh, a, an excellent tool that should be used in these kind of scenarios because it serves two functions. It serves the function of fact gathering sometimes, which you cannot investigate, uh, investigations won't give because of these situations and relationships relationship and I think that is an important tool for us to have to gather facts. The second thing is that it establishes the threshold with a participation from citizens uh, uh, interaction whether probable cause for indictment to go to that standard is there. So in our state we had this grand jury stat statute did not give us access. Uh, there were other issues. In fact right now my office is litigating up to the Supreme Court about some separation of powers issues in the as implemented. I think the in the Missouri case that happened, I think the one good positive thing was that there was a grand jury system and I am a huge fan of uh, publishing that information so there is transparency about it and, and then it lets everybody look at it in the totality and say, did that prosecutor do this job right? Did that law enforcement officer do their job right? What were the facts that were presented to them? Because the goal is to be transparent so we can make the best judgment at the end of the day. So uh, there's the answer. Your first question was, was the union involved in our policy development? And that's, yes, we have two different associations, one for the line officer and then for the managers, sergeants and lieutenants. And they are at the table at a, in a use of force policy committee. They're constantly there with input uh, on, on all our policies, but those specific. And yes, those are compelled statements within that internal review of all officers. So therefore, they are not public statements. And. Uh Columbus has a very good reputation for doing a good job in this state. Um, in Fr Columbus is in Franklin County in Ohio. Every officer involved shooting in, in Franklin County goes to the grand jury. 
Um, it's not weeded out ahead of time. It's, it's presented to the grand jury. Um, the officers know the process. It is well established. It is the same every time. Um, it doesn't bend to uh, um, political pressures. It's the same process, and the officers find it fair, and uh, there has not been the, the, the same kind of uproar in Columbus as there has been in other parts of Ohio. Thank you. Uh, Roberto Villasenor, followed by Jose Lopez. My question is for Mr. Gill, and I was listening to your, your testimony and, and the fact that you have reviewed so many events and your recent answer in that none have gone forward to the grand jury, have, but you have brought forward prosecution on a couple of those, correct? Yes. Okay. My question is, and I think that police, from what I hear in talking departments, and part of the concern and fear is that everyone wants an independent review and I understand that, but the fear that I hear is that this will be much more politically influenced than anything currently, even though current county attorneys such as yourself are also subject to being voted out if they go against the will. So we have to address those concerns, and yet you have instances where, such as uh, Major McDonald talked about, oftentimes you interact with people who have their mind made up about what you've done before you've done anything. And so how do you deal with those conflicts and adversarial positions and still maintain a sense of equity and fairness for police as well as the community? Right. Um, I think you move away from, uh, as, as I think mentioned by one of our colleagues, you move away from a uh, uh, outcome-driven, as I took it, outcome-driven uh, thing to a process-driven model. And so what you do is, uh, for example, uh, you have to have a process which is transparent, objective, uh, and so there is trust from both sides. And you make the decision as you see it. Uh, I, I, I've made decisions uh, which were in uh, support of law enforcement in a very complex case. Um, I took criticism for that. I made a decision uh, uh, in a, uh, going against and holding and uh, saying a shooting was unjustified. I took criticism for that. I cannot please either side. So I knew that what I have to do is commit to the process and invest in the process. And the more transparent I can make the process, the more objective that I can make the process, you and I may have a genuine disagreement about what the outcome should have been. But the disagreement you and I should not have is the integrity of the process that was employed. The best compliment that I've had in four and a half years was that a citizen came up to me and told me, he said, I absolutely disagree with the decision that was not a justified shoot. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and he goes, but I, I trust the process. I, I'm glad that you're the one and, and your process is what's there. Now our process is not perfect. There is a lot that needs to be improved upon it. But we started a conversation because they know that there's nothing for us to gain. We take hits from both sides, but we keep pointing to the process and the transparency of the process. We will not, if, we, if you and I are trying to find a solution about how to please everyone, we will fail miserably. The only thing we can do is to say in a participatory democracy, this is what integrity looks like, this is what accountability is all about, and we are embracing it, we are not shying away from it, and when somebody raises an issue, we should run towards them because we are public servants in a public institution there to meet the expectations of our citizens rather than the concerns about our own personal agendas. Well answered, sir. Uh, thank you. Jose Lopez, followed by Cedric Alexander. Yeah, I have uh, questions for Mr. Wexler and uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Mr. Wexler, when you're talking about uh, de-escalation in your statement, um, one of the things that you mention and you quote um, one chief who expresses uh, somebody has to be the adult in the room, the one to de-escalate tensions, and it has to be the police officer. Uh, and that seems to challenge the notion from the last panel made by Michael McHale. In his statement, he, he says officers are taught that the person who comes into contact with the officer controls the level of force. Uh, and so, you know, if I'm an officer, just anyone listening, it seems like a mixed message to me. Uh, so I guess the question is, uh, which, which is it? Actually, I think it's probably some of both. Um, when we're talking about low-level kinds of situations as, as opposed to you know, something as significant as active shooter or something, where you're talking about something relatively minor, 
and a citizen is very agitated and maybe disrespectful to the police officer. We can't control the citizen's behavior. We can't tell the citizen what to do. But we can have an expectation of the police officer that the, if they're trained in crisis intervention skills, if they're trained in de-escalating, if they have verbal judo, all of these things, all of these mechanisms that they've learned to try as best they can to slow the situation down. Now, on the other hand, if the citizens' actions and so forth go in the other direction, they have to use other strategies. So, you know, it's a combination of things. You know, these situations can go up and they can go down. And I think we do a good job of training officers to deal with the use of force continuum. What we don't do, and this really comes from Commissioner Ramsey, is we don't do a good job of teaching them how to bring it down when the danger is different. So I think, I think you know, look, let's be honest. We expect today's police officers to be superhuman. And maybe that's unfair, but on the other hand, you know, they, are, they have they sometimes have to make life and death situations. And we have seen small things escalate into big things. Mm -hmm. What we haven't been able to, to do as effectively as we want is to train officers that it's okay sometimes, it's okay sometimes to step back, call <coughs> a supervisor, get additional officers. We work in Scotland, Police Scotland. They have no guns there, only Certain officers have guns. So they are confronted with a number of situations similar here, mostly knives, not guns. They have to train their officers how to deal with someone with a, with a knife, club, and so forth without guns. There is no guns to, to speak of. So they have to have those kind of skills. We can learn from those kind of situations. <clears throat> uh, follow up to, to your uh testimony, Mr. Wexler, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, how some chiefs speak of a duty to intervene. Right. Uh, and so uh, this is based on my own anecdotal evidence, kind of my own personal experiences. I have been stopped in New York City uh, many times, and I've also stopped to record incidents between officers and civilians uh, many times. And, and I can't think of a moment where when I've seen an officer overly agitated uh, and, and having one of his peers on site, his, his peer, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of checking him, putting him on, on check. Uh, and so uh, what steps, I guess my question is, what steps can departments take uh, to facilitate uh, a better process for, uh, for intervention from peer officers? Well, this comes, this comes from leadership. This comes from the top on down. You know, when, when, the, when the chief says, look, I expect you, if one of your officers is agitated, I expect you to step in and do something. That comes from the top. One of the worst things about the Rodney King incident was the officer's behavior. But was what really was worse was there were sergeants on the scene. The fact that those sergeants didn't intervene was a total lack of control. So as we think about this, you do have a culture, but the culture should also say, look, you're heavily involved, step back, step back, cool off, let me take over. And that's a good thing, that should be a good thing because they're protecting each other. And in a day and age when there's body cameras, and these cameras are gonna show a bunch of officers sitting ar standing around while one officer is hitting another, and these other officers are standing there, they are all cu culpable if they're all standing there. So if there wasn't a duty to intervene before, there should be now. Just the, so you mentioned Rodney King, and it makes me think about the, the recent case in, in Staten Island with Eric Garner. Uh, so just for the record, in, in those severe cases, uh, like the case that we just saw in Staten Island, when officers do not intervene, should all officers on site be held accountable? Look, I don't know the facts of that case. I've only seen the videotape. But I'll say this, I don't think anyone intended to kill that man. I think a terrible tragedy, terrible tragedy. And, uh, you know, Jim Fife again, talks about positional asphyxia and so forth terrible tragedy, but I don't think anyone intended to kill that man. 
If I may, final question for Mr. McDonald, or is, is time? I, I think we're, we're running so late. Let me turn to uh, Cedric Alexander, and Connie Rice will then follow and uh, be the last questioner. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, uh, just one or two questions, uh, Dr. Wexman, if time permits, I also would like to address a question to uh, Mr. Gill in, uh, uh, in regards to his community in Salt Lake City as well, too. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Wexman, you indicated in your statement here, and I'm just going to read this last sentence here, we need to re-engineer our police training. We need to re-engineer how police training is conducted so that it integrate all aspects of police work in ways that mirror what actually happens on the street. Could you just speak a little bit to that when you talk about re-engineering, what does that look like? Well, I, I know time's limited, so I'll, I'll just say that um, I, I believe that we teach things in segmented ways. We say, here's, here's, here's the course on dealing with the mentally ill. Here's the course on use of force continuum. Here's the course. They're not separate components. They, they, you need, today's police officer needs to be able to switch from one to the other. And so that's what we talk. And too many courses are simply not reality-based. And I think the Las Vegas model, what I heard from there, is very encouraging. Okay, thank you, and, and, and I agree with you as well, too. What, one other thing that you had mentioned uh, not too long ago, you were talking about uh, in New York City, how officers were trained not to stand in front of a car that's coming at you. Correct. And uh, once they stopped that practice, there was a significant decrease in those negative interactions. Correct. And I think, and, and help me because I don't want to speak for you, but it really sounds like based on the empirical data or research that was done that indicated that there was significant drop in that negative interaction as it relates to such. Would you be su suggesting then what occurred in New York City and still stands today maybe needs to be a standard of practice across the country? And would that be suggestive of some standardizations as it relates to certain policies that could be to the advantage of a lot of departments across this country if we start looking at the research and the data that has held up, particularly over time? No, that policy, it's 1972, is, is the policy that PERF recommends, is the policy a number of departments recommend it. But there is some misunderstanding uh, on the part of officers that still believe that they should have the option to use deadly force in those situations. And in fact, some police chiefs, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Evans, who instituted this uh, policy, received a vote of no confidence. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about them, but the reality is they should go back to New York City and talk about that policy because today, you know, a number of people are, are alive today because of that policy. It's sound, it protects officers, it protects citizens. Okay. So in respect for time, I will... Uh, if I may just, just quickly, yeah. the four unjustified shootings that my office has determined are all tied to uh, cars. And so that should give you an indication. We have a mutual friend uh, who is uh, Chief Burbank. He's the first chief in Salt Lake City. He's the largest municipality who I think has implemented for the first time a, a internal policy uh, modifying the use of force in, in vehicles. That one, that's a perfect example as a national standard, which is, should be maybe best practices, can have a dramatic impact on the number of use of force that involve motor vehicles alone. And that would be a significant statistical impact on the totality of those use of force cases. Okay, so, so, so that being said, I won't ask any further questions, but I am going to make a comment in regards to that. I hear that loud and clear, and I'm quite sure if I would ask Mr. McDonald his thoughts about that, he probably would see it a little bit different sure. in the sense that a vehicle coming at me, common sense is for me to move out the way, but I'm quite sure there have been circumstances, in fact, I know of circumstances over 37 years in this profession where I don't have the opportunity to move out the way. Absolutely. Or I may have a car that is intentionally trying to do harm, not maybe just to me, but also to citizens, and other decisions may have to be made. But each and every case is very, very Absolutely. different in that regard. But one real question, uh, uh, one quick question, Mr. Gill, and I can't get past this. In your community, Salt Lake City, uh, you stated very early on, it does not, your community certainly does not look like many parts of the country that are stressed now with police community relations as relates to communities of color. Yes. Okay. So, but in, in Salt Lake City, you have a pretty homogeneous community there. Yes. 
But I think it's important for everyone here to note and for the country that's watching and listening in to note that in Salt Lake City, are you suggesting that the systemic changes that maybe need to be made in this country as relates to criminal justice is not just in communities of color, but in communities like yours where people may feel because of their economic status or religious affiliations, they somehow may feel discriminated against. So very, very quickly, can you just talk to that? Because I think all of us need to hear that as it relates to uh, your community. Absolutely. I think anybody in this day and age who would deny uh, race relation tensions, I think, is not paying attention to, the, uh, to our community at large. That's a r real inner city problem, and we need to acknowledge that. I think my point was simply in making the thing that there are broader systemic issues. I think that's a very important one. Uh, race issues are very important, but there are systemic issues both in terms of culture and practice that we can benefit as a, a law enforcement institution and that we may, as systemic failures, may be contributing uh, to the kind of errors that we're finding in our community. And those change in practices will be a benefit to all different communities. They will not be the same answer to all communities because each community may have their own unique features. But I think there are certain common denominators and features that we can change that will give us the better, out better outcomes than the ones that we're getting. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, our last questioner is Connie Rice. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Robinson. And um, Assistant Sheriff Primus, you are in grave danger of going on my short list of large departments that really get it. So if your department is really doing half of what you say they're doing, and now I have to come and see for myself because of what you described, but the way you describe what you're doing tells me that at minimum you get it. You are really fluent, really fluent in the systemic changes that produce trust with the community. And I was delighted to hear you. Um, I only hope you have a lot of sway and aren't somebody on the fringes of a department that thinks you're crazy. Um, and I'll be coming out there before the summer heat hits to verify this. So thank you for, for laying out an incredibly fluent, sensitive, uh, knowledgeable set of notions about how you turn a department around so that it starts thinking through the community's situation and that the police are no longer thinking of the community as the enemy or just the outsiders. I think, I think what you laid out was beautiful. Thank you. Um, now, with that said, can you name some other departments that are doing it the way you're doing it and thinking about it the way you're thinking about it? I just want to know the names of all of you. If you have the names of departments that you can point us to that get it. They get the systemic change, the comprehensive nature of it, the need to be able to see through the community's eyes what they're seeing when they look at you and the ability to understand your officers' fears so that you can ameliorate them and mitigate them and give your officers the protections that will give them the strength to actually reach out to the community as partners. With all of that said, are there other departments that we need to be looking at that do that? Well, I think I'm supposed to say LA, so I will. Yes, say, uh, you are. I will you. say Los Angeles. <laughs> Uh, but you know, uh, uh, there's a several departments that do certain things well, and, and, and they're progressive. Austin's one of them, I think, was mentioned. Charlotte Mecklenburg was mentioned. Nashville does some really good policing uh, models. Uh, so those off the top of my head. And, and you know, back to LA, we've been down to LA several times, and for stolen several concepts of, of how that agency does some yeah, business. But they, they there's no one do. that's a perfect model. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I would agree that there's lots of places that do lots of different things well and, and uh, that we can gather um, good information from lots of different places. I, I'm going to say a couple places um, that I'm familiar with in Ohio that I think do a good job. Um, one is the city of Oregon, which is suburban Toledo. Um, one is the big city would be here in Cincinnati. They've, they've made a lot of strides since the, um, you know, the, the unrest that happened. Uh, a decade or so ago. Um, and they, they get a lot of attention for the strides that they've made here in Cincinnati, and they've done that by working with all members of the community 
and members of the police department, not just the chief, but all the way down, uh, including rank and file officers. So there's two different size departments, a, a small suburban agency and a, uh, and a large metropolitan department. Thank you. I, I, I agree totally about Cincinnati. I think Chief Blackwell's done an amazing job. Thank you. I, I'll go ahead and pass. I don't have the, the, the reference point for that. Thank you. Well, of course, Philadelphia and Tucson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You're going to have to give me some basis for believing that. Uh, you know, I, I can't answer that question because I'd lose my job. Uh, but um, I will say this to you, Ms. Rice. I will say this to you uh -huh. because uh, we were hired by the Los Angeles Police Department after Bernard Parks retired to find them a police chief. And the Los Angeles Police Department, as you well know, was a certain kind of agency, and they wanted a transformational police chief. They got one, yep. and they got one that followed him, Charlie Beck. Yep. And, and so, you know, I know this sounds self-serving, because I don't know you from a hole in the wall, but I'll say this. Your role and your role with Bratton and Charlie Beck, Los Angeles Police Department is a different place today because of what you all have done. Uh -oh. And that's about all I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very politic and also very true. <laughs> well, that's a good note to end up on. Uh, please join me in thanking our terrific panelists. Yes.